Whether you're a Christian or not, one cannot deny the impact Jesus of Nazareth has had on the world, and more specifically, Western society. Our modern calendar, which uses the abbreviations BC and AD, stand for Before Christ and Anno Domini, Latin for Year of Our Lord. Even though secular scholars are trying to replace it with BCE and CE, it still matches the earlier focal point of time abbreviations of BC and AD. Historian Philip Schaff described the overwhelming influence Jesus had on the subsequent history and cultures of the world. He stated, This Jesus of Nazareth, without money and arms, conquered more millions than Alexander the Great, Caesar, Mohammed, and Napoleon. Without science, he shed more light on things human and divine than all philosophers and scholars combined. Without the eloquence of schools, he spoke such words of life as were never spoken before or since and produced effects which lie beyond the reach of orator or poet. Without writing a single line, he set more pens in motion and furnished themes for sermons, orations, discussions, large volumes, works of art, and songs of praise than the whole army of great men of ancient and modern times. That being said, virtually all scholars believe Jesus of Nazareth was a real person and that he was crucified in the spring of either AD 30 or AD 33. So how is his message spread throughout the world, having an astonishing following of over 2.6 billion people? Who were his 12 disciples? And what happened to them? Let's try and find out. Hello, I'm Mike Joberg, Marine Corps veteran and filmmaker, and we will try to answer these questions on today's episode of Forgotten History. After Jesus was crucified, and whether you believe that that was his demise or if you believe he was resurrected after three days, as Christians do, he did leave this earth one way or another and tasked the disciples with what is called the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 16-20 describes the Great Commission as follows. Then the eleven disciples, his disciple Judas was already dead at this point, went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Who were his disciples, and how were they chosen? The Gospels list them as follows. Simon who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Sometimes the apostles' names and surnames were interchanged as following, Bartholomew as Nathaniel, Matthew as Levi, Thomas as Didymus, and Thaddeus as Jude or Lebius. So now that we have identified their names, let's find out what happened to them. Only two of the disciples' deaths are mentioned in the Bible, so I will use extra biblical accounts to go over the works and the deaths of the others. According to the Bible, Judas Iscariot was the first one to perish. Today, the name Judas is virtually synonymous with the word traitor. Among the disciples, Judas was the official treasurer, but he was apparently a man of dubious character even before he made his big debut as the worst person in history. While the Bible tells us how Jesus called some of the disciples, that's not the case with Judas Iscariot. He simply listed among the twelve. And it might seem like a huge oversight on Jesus' part to call someone who was so fatally flawed and would eventually betray him, but each of the disciples were flawed. Leading up to Judas' betrayal of Jesus, there are a handful of details we can gather from the passages he appears in. The Gospel of John tells us that Judas Iscariot oversaw the group's money. You might think that a tax collector, like his disciple Matthew, would have been a natural choice for managing the group's finances. However, tax collectors had a well-deserved reputation for being dishonest with money in Jesus' day. So while Matthew was financially savvy, 
the other disciples may not have trusted him, or perhaps Jesus didn't want to give him the temptation. In any case, Judas Iscariot may have been considered good with money or trustworthy, but John 12, 3 through 6 tells us a different story. This passage tells us of the famous account of Mary, who anoints Jesus' feet with a pint of expensive perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who would later betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief as the keeper of the money bag. He used it to help himself to what was put into it. Because of Jesus' radical message and his claim of divinity, the chief priests plotted to arrest and kill Jesus. Judas offers to hand him over. Matthew 26, 14 through 16 reads, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over, and he did. During the Last Supper, Matthew 26, 20 through 25 reads, When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go, just as is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. After the Last Supper, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane with Peter, John, and his brother James to pray. In his prayer, he asked God to protect the disciples and says that none of them have been lost while he was with them, with one exception. John 17, 12 reads, None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Soon, Judas appeared with the chief priest's guards. Matthew 26, 48 through 50 reads, Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. They brought Jesus to the chief priests. Once the chief priests found Jesus guilty of blasphemy and handed him over to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, to be crucified, Judas had a change of heart. Matthew 27, 3-5 reads, When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? The chief priest replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. And then he went away and hanged himself. So was Judas Iscariot simply an opportunist, seeking a chance to make some extra money? Or did he really believe nothing could stop Jesus? So betraying him and forcing a conflict would only accelerate his plan to restore the kingdom to Israel from Roman occupation. Or was there something more? At the end of Jesus' temptation in the desert, where he was tormented by Satan for 40 days, Luke 4.13 reads, When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Judas provided both the time and the opportunity. Then Luke 22.1-3 reads, Now the festival of unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. This almost seems to shift some of the blame from Judas, perhaps suggesting that he was doomed to destruction because he was the most vulnerable and available to Satan's influence. With a kiss, Judas Iscariot sealed his own fate and became one of the most reviled characters in all literature, and at the same time, he accidentally triggered the most celebrated event in human history. Judas was the first follower of Jesus to die, but James, the brother of John, was the first to be martyred for his faith in Christ. So what does the Bible say about James, and how did he get his nickname, Son of Thunder? James, fisherman by trade, was one of the first disciples called by Jesus. Mark 1, 16-20 reads, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, 
for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in a boat with the hired men and followed him. James would quickly become part of Jesus' inner circle. Such examples of this can be seen as when Jesus went to resurrect the deceased daughter of the synagogue leader Jairus. Mark 5:37 reads, He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And in Matthew 17, 1 and 2, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as the light. Scholars believe James and John were given the nickname Sons of Thunder after an event that occurred in Samaria. Luke 9, 52-55 reads, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead who went to the Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. James would later suffer death at the hands of King Herod Agrippa, who carried a dual Jewish and Roman identity and played the role of intercessor on behalf of the Jews with the Roman authorities. In the book of Acts, chapter 12, 1 through 4 reads, It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. Scholars agree that the death of James occurred around the year 44 AD in Jerusalem. Another account concerning the death of James comes from the second century writer Clement of Alexandria, who recounts a bold story of James on the way to his death. The man assigned to guard James was so moved by the disciples' amazing courage that he declared himself a Christian and was beheaded alongside James. But where was James for the 11 or so years before his death? James is known in Spanish as Santiago, and he's the patron saint of Spain, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and of fishermen. But why is James the patron saint of these Spanish-influenced countries? The 7th century text, the Breviarium Apostolorum, says that James came to Spain around 40 AD to preach the Gospels. In Roman times, Spain and Portugal were known by the name Hispania, and it is thought that James arrived on the peninsula either by boat, via the Strait of Gibraltar, or via modern-day Tarragona. After arriving, he went north through Portugal and arrived at Iria Flavia, where he continued to preach and move eastwards. James preached in the region until his return to Jerusalem, where he was killed. After his death, according to legend, his body, along with his followers, sailed back to the Iberian Peninsula. Landing on the northwest coast, they proceeded up the river Ula and landed back at Iria Flavia, where he spent much of his ministry, which is now modern-day Padron. At the time, the Celtic queen Lupia ruled these lands. When asked by James's followers if they could bury his body, she refused to send troops after them. While chasing the follower of James with his body across the bridge, it collapsed, killing her troops. Queen Lupia then converted to Christianity and provided an ox and cart for the followers of James to transport the body. Unsure of where they should bury the sacred remains, his followers prayed and decided to let the ox continue until it chose a place to rest. After pausing at a stream, the ox finally came to rest under an oak tree at the top of a hill. It is here that the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela stands today. James has clearly left a significant mark in Spain and other areas where Spanish influence has been strong. Many cities bear his name, Santiago, such as in the countries of Chile, Cuba, and the Dominican Republic. This concludes the first episode of the series. We will continue with the disciple Philip in the next episode of the Twelve. Thank you for watching Forgotten History. Please like, share, and subscribe. If you have any comments or show ideas, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks again.